Good morning, everyone. This is Arts Beat Radio here on television and radio this morning. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach, and I am really excited because we have a full hour today with the great people from Theatre Works in Hartford. Rob Ruggiero, who's their artistic director, and Tanisha Dugan, who's the associate artistic director. Lots to learn about because Theatre Works spent the last spring and summer renovating itself. And I guess that's almost all done. Yeah, we're like we're like in the I call it the sprint to the finish line. We had a, actually a donor event, a sneak preview last night, but paint's still drying. There's still things coming in, but every day is transformative. And you you actually had to leave your home to perform at the Wadsworth Athenaeum's Theater for several productions. So it must be, feel really good to be back in your own digs. Oh, we could not wait. I think everybody on staff, like we just couldn't. We've been living through like no. No HVAC, so much dust, so much noise, and you know the uh, it's a was such a gift. We're so grateful to have gone to the Wadsworth, but it's you know it's an obstacle. We had to bring it. it just our rhythms have been off for what, seven months now, Tanisha. Yeah, we're. I mean, it's so exciting to have actors you know, rehearsing in the same building that they're going to perform in. You know, when we were at the Wadsworth, everyone was sort of between two places. So to have everything in our one home again is really exciting for the actors to sort of hop down to the offices and spend time, you know, with our box office team or with marketing or with Rob. Um, It is, as Rob says, transformative, both to see the space sort of changing before our eyes, but to have our our artists sort of at home again in Mm. one building. Well, most of the renovations, as I understand, were backstage and behind the scenes. But when people go to Theatre Works and the season opens imminently uh, with a great play, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, what will people see that's new and different? Well, there's really, you know, it is trans, pretty transformative. Uh, like, first of all, the whole building has been touched <laughs> in some way because part of this $5.7 million renovation was brand new fire safety and everything's up to code and brand new HVAC, air conditioning and heat all through the whole building. So that's like, that's the messy part. But but what you're going to see when you come into the building, the, the theater lobby is transformative. It's unrecognizable from what people saw before. So that's the, the, the kind of wow splashy yeah. factor Rob and, it's, and a good friend of ours Sal Modifica have kind of brought the building back to life it's a 1927 uh, Moorish revival and they have you know with Rob's vision artistically and Sal's beautiful interior mind uh, they've really like I said, brought this building back to life and in a modern way. And so I think, you know, Rob has been calling it Hartford's living room. um, And I think it really will be that warm and cozy, but also majestic and honoring that 1927, you know, vibe that that building has. It's exciting. In in terms of the theater itself, what the, when the audience sits down, that hasn't really changed. Well, what I like to say is it's the same, only better. Mm -hmm. Um, So like, right. So when the lobby space, and is totally, you know, open now. Like the historical ceiling is open and the historical staircase is open. And then you go down and what what it is now in a, in a really beautiful way is probably one of the most well-equipped intimate black boxes, you know, in the country, uh, definitely in the state. And so you come down into the space now, it's all black, black floors, black walls, which they were, and it's cozy. The seats... The seating risers were the only things that were not touched. They're like they're still there with brand new, beautiful seats with lumbar support that I <laughs> promise. But there's a new uh, production booth, um, and there's brand new dressing rooms for the actors. That's what you won't see, mm-hmm. and and the new bathrooms for the audience and for the actors. And the ceiling is lifted. It's just this beautiful, I don't know, is there anything else I'm missing to you? No, I think, you know, for those of you who visit us before, the bathrooms is the real thing. <laughs> that as an audience member is going to change your life, right? Elevator. Uh, and, and yes, and an elevator that goes directly from uh, the main floor down to the theater. I think those two sort of creature comforts that, you know, we've been doing yeoman's work without is going to really feel different to our audiences when they return. I'm looking forward to the elevator because I remember coming to a show 
before I was injured and needing to use the elevator, and it creaked like that movie, yes. really Modern Millie. She's an old girl. Coming down <laughs> in, in, in the elevator, and you, you thought, well, maybe I have to tap dance to get it. To uh, down to it's the very dance. slow. The new one, it's a brand new one, um, and it's really just a dedicated elevator, and it's right near the stairways that go down. It you enter from the same perspective that the that the stair patrons on the stairs do. You're gonna love it. It's beautiful. It's good. And for those of you who m- may have remembered that, um, you know, you used to come early and hang out because we had a different kind of seating system. We're really encouraging people to bring back that old habit and hang out with their friends and meet new ones. So I think that's the thing that people uh, love so much about TheaterWorks is that opportunity. And so with this beautiful lobby that uh, Sal and Rob have appointed, we're inviting people to come early and stay after. You know, we've got we are known for doing shows that are conversation starters, and so we're looking forward to people having those conversations uh, in that. And lobby. right behind us is the is uh, was the theater in that's earlier in the re- in the renovation, of course. That's the theater space, and when it was, you see the old like clay tile. You can see that how clean and open the seats are not on yet. And you can see the booth in the background, though, Mark. See that right behind the I do, I do. Yeah. This was uh, probably four, five, four months ago or something. Yeah, but it's really, it's really happening. We're excited. But nope. that all looks just black, cozy, and beautiful now. I remember last year we came down and we taped a special uh, for WSKB uh, from the stage during Christmas on the Rocks. Mm. And I had a chance. It was the first time I actually stood on the theater work stage and I realized how small it was <laughs> and yet the shows when you sat in the audience looked huge mm. you know and uh, yeah. I think that uh, seeing where they did all the quick changes for that show which required like a million costume changes in 90 minutes how they did it in that small an area was just well we have one of the big things we keep I didn't mention it last night either is that we have stage left you know it's all opened been opened up the architecture has been removed so for you know this is our 34th season we've been in that space probably 30 31 seasons I don't know and um we never, everybody didn't know this, but there was like architecture stage left. So we had stage right where you, where you saw we dominated or angled, but stage left was a four foot, maybe at best wide hallway to the stage. The rest of it, we couldn't use. So, huh. it was, so it's like, we feel so liberated. It is. And I think, you know, sort of a spoiler uh, when you come to see the first show of the season you'll really get a chance to experience what it's like to have wall to wall set design which is a, which is a new thing for us yeah I remember seeing a play the wolves there and watch it it looked like the stage extended forever and you so you see remember the wolves and if you think back on it it was like center and then to you to how to stage a house left it was open and then there was the entrance where they came in which was like cinder block well that was all architecture back there well now if we had done the wolves this season the whole thing could have been open amazing i you know i'm so excited about the new season and i've got to say that those of you that are in the berkshires or those of you that go to the bushnell may have seen one or two or three of the plays and musicals before but I first of all, I, the season opens with American Sun, which is a play that had its world premiere at Barrington stage and had such an impact on me personally that I went with a friend and we've been talking about this play ever since because of the impact and, and the things that it made you think about. So you're really opening with a kind of a powerhouse of a play yeah I really it was the first thing I I I think it was the very first thing we brought uh I brought I, I just you know we talked as a team I really wanted our first show back in the new space to represent us in many ways you know to represent our bravery to represent this the kind of work and art and voices that we like to produce and I I wanted to start with something very important and relevant to a conversation of America today 
I don't know if, if you, I, I feel like this does all that. I mean, it went to Barrington. It ended up on Broadway with Kerry Washington. And I've been tracking the play and I was able to really get the rights very early on. We're one of the few theaters to have the rights post uh, the Broadway production. And I, I understand it's been filmed for Netflix uh, while it was running on Broadway, but that hasn't happened yet. It, it's supposed to screen sometime, November. Like, sometime in November. But to me, seeing it live in the theater, it's a taut play. Very, It's a thriller to one extent, but it also is very emotionally riveting. And I can't imagine that having a reaction to it, seeing it on the small screen on Netflix or as you would live in the theater. Well, I think it's a really great point, Mark, and I think that yeah, I'm excited to see that too, but this play, to be in the room and be in our space, connected to the life on stage, is going to make it much more immediate and, 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 and beautifully engaging. Did you happen, either one of you, see it at Barrington Stage? I, I've seen, raise my hand, I've <laughs> seen, um, I tracked it from the beginning. I saw it at Barrington, and I saw it on Broadway, and just been kind of watching it, and they've made some, you know, he's made some nice changes as the, it's gone along, but I, I really am excited to open our season with that story. Um, uh, how, much, how many changes in American Sun were made from the very beginning to now? Um, I, I don't know how many changes, nothing like overtly profound, like no big restructuring, but there's an editing and a, and, and a kind of editing and adding of dialogue that I think is a little more meaningful and truthful. We, the actors and I were talking about that because when we auditioned, we, they used the manuscript from the casting director of, from the uh, older mm -hmm. script. And they're like, there's been a couple of moments, I would say at least three, where they're like, oh, this is so much better than mm -hmm. that because I believe this more or it's a little more accurate. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, you, unless you were studied both scripts, you wouldn't know, but, but as an experience, you feel it. Is it difficult um, directing a play like American Sun that brings so many emotions to the surface and is so riveting to watch? Does is it difficult for you as a director um, to do you get swept up by it? Do the actors get swept up by it? Or well, we we like to we have to laugh at rehearsal because it's intense. It's certainly an intense journey so I always make sure that we have some time you know to, to laugh because it, you know it's intense to be there but yes you know even uh, when we were you know uh, reading the play at the table like every time the end just gets me it just really gets me and I know what's I know where it's going um, and I have we have a beautiful cast assembled um, and I was able to you know I usually you either I either do shows that I've never seen and we've read and in the case of like Tanisha's show last season, actually, I never saw it, we, but we read it and we did a little reading upstairs. Or in this case, it's just strange that I've seen both, uh, but two productions, but I was able to, in this case, I have opinions about how, how it should be cast and, and that relationship that we're able to explore differently for our space. Do you want to give a little uh, synopsis of it without giving away the ending so people can get an idea of what American Sun is all about? Do you want to take that, T? No, go for okay. it. You got this. <laughs> um, it. It takes place now in the middle of the night in a police station in Miami, Florida. And at the beginning of the play, you see this, you know, uh, a black woman texting and she's you find out quickly she's the mother of a son who's missing and her only interaction is with this very white newbie uh, cop, uh, a police officer I should say cop and they're going along and so there's a you know she's you know clearly trying to find her son and there's that suspense and at a certain point uh, a few minutes in I would say maybe even 20 pages in um, this man shows up who he misidentifies as a lieutenant that's supposed to be coming who's a white man and an FBI detective and you find out I think this is not a spoiler alert I hope not but it's too late that they're a couple because I think it's important to the story that you that he that we're dealing with a mixed race couple and a biracial child. And, and, and really, the show is about that marriage, which is breaking down. They're separated. And the son, the event with the son becomes a catalyst for a really, really important dialogue about 
marriage, about mixed race marriage, about a, a young man identifying as black or white in America today. And I think I can't tell much more than that. Do you want? Did I miss anything, T? No, I think that that's good. That's a good like um, primer. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much the situation. And then from there, you know, really intense things happen. Mm-hmm. And um, when does it open? When does it close? And how can people get tickets? Awesome! It opens on October eighteenth. It closes on November twenty third. Uh, and you can get tickets at twhartford.org. TWHartford.org. And TheaterWorks is right in the heart of downtown Hartford. So easy to get to. Easy to get to and plenty of parking nearby. Big, lots of parking of lots. And on if you come, you get it right, a lot of on-street free parking, you know, most of the times when we do shows at night. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's <clears throat> and accessible to lots of great restaurants. We have a lot of great restaurant partners, really great food. And we are... You know, that kind of beautiful mid-size. I mean, our space is unique. And people who have loved our journey outside of the space are so happy to come back because I call it the hug, Mark. You know, it's like a modified thrust. We now have 188 seats. I made the seats a little bigger, so there's a couple of less seats. 188 seats, really beautiful, intimate theater. You feel... You never feel like the art and the story is there. You feel like it's, you know, across the room. You feel like it's right. You feel like you're in in it with them, which I love. And we're so lucky because, you know, we're on a block that's so vibrant with the Goodwin Hotel. And this is the sort of time of year to take some time and kind of hang out in New England. Um, so I'm always an advocate for making a weekend to come and hang out with us, to come and stay at the Goodwin and see a show with us and, you know, go harvest, you know, with some grapes (laughs) or some apples and either apple pick or grab some wine. I think we're so lucky about our location on Pearl Street um, that you can really, as as we do coming up to the Berkshires, you know, you can really kind of come down to Connecticut and have a a beautiful New England weekend Mm -hmm. and see American Sun. One of the things I learned last year was that you can take the train Mm -hmm. down with the uh, CT rail from Springfield Mm -hmm. or Greenfield, uh, Northampton, Holyoke, and Springfield, right down to Hartford. And the train is about four blocks from TheaterWorks. It's a short block. Yes. simple walk Mm -hmm. um so if you don't feel like driving and parking in hartford jump on the train and my little hint is the parking is free at the windsor lock station so if Ah. you're driving south you don't want to spend money to park in springfield just go to windsor locks leave the car get on the train great idea pro tip pro tip (laughs) this is the 34th season yes Um, you, you, you've distinguished yourselves from the Bushnell, which brings in popular fare, or Hartford Stage, which brings in larger shows and a mix of classic and contemporary. You guys have always done cutting-edge plays, new works by voices that are not often heard enough in the theater. I don't know much about the playwright from of American Sun, but you've had plays that represent uh, the Latinx experience, uh, the African-American experience, experience of women, uh, and, and all of that, which really is non-traditional in the kind of theater. Is, is this part of, the, did it evolve this way or is this a conscious choice it's definitely part of our mission i mean we're definitely harvard's contemporary theater our mission basically brings that lens into doing contemporary work recently produced work we're trying to do more new work we're actually doing some more developmental work tanisha is pretty much spearheading that and we really try hard to find and this is the season that that's coming up our first season back, I really, really tried to get a season that had stories that represented America holistically. And I'm also proud, I have to say, of the fact that I'm doing two shows as the producing artistic director, but the other three directors are all women. And and uh, and and I'm I, I feel really proud of that. We really tried to. And one of them is a recent Yale graduate, mm-hmm. um, and she's South Asian. And this is one of her, her first times to direct uh, professionally. Yeah, Anisha Kudtukar. Um, she is incredible and so smart, smart. Uh, and really has a has a great eye to to 
telling to storytelling. That's really her strength, and she's directing um, Ayad Akhtar's Who and the What, um, which we're excited about. Our audiences have loved seeing Ayad's work in our space. We did Invisible Hand. Uh, is that two seasons ago now? Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, so we're very excited. We're bringing back Rajesh Bose, who uh, won the CCCs uh, for Invisible Hand. And actually, you know, a tip of the hat to Rob because he's really sort of piloting this new paradigm in theater where you don't just, you know, as artistic director, make a choice for a play. He's He loved working with Rajesh and said, what do you want to work on? And I think this idea that you're bringing other artists to the table to help you season plan is so magnificent and so collaborative. Um, and so Rajesh, you know, and Rob spoke and, and, and uh, Ayad's piece came up and bubbled up to the fore and, and we read it and, and we loved it and we saw why he loved it so much. Um, and so it's it's exciting. I mean, you pointed out some things about our, our theater that is, is so true. Um, I think that's why we've built the audiences that we've built. I mean, Freddie... Is, is the queen of saying, you know, for a theater our size, we've got an abundance of subscribers and we're so lucky. And I think that's because of the work that Rob has selected over uh, the number of years, you know, he and his partner, uh, the founder of the organization. And Rob has, has you know, diligently um, held true to that mission. Um, and this this season is a, is a beautiful example of that. You know, like you said, queer stories, women's stories, uh, people, colors of, uh, stories of people of color. Uh, now that we've got our new space and it is so much more accessible to um, our handicap artists, we can now consider works like that and working with artists um, who are uh, differently abled and that's really exciting mm-hmm. so you know we've we've hit a really exciting time one of our new dressing rooms we have three yeah. now we used to have one and a half mm-hmm. I guess we have three now and we can without even adding in which we can we can without a blink of an eye we can accommodate eight actors Mm -hmm. and there's even space to in those rooms to add a table Um, and one of them is is completely accessible and the other thing that I find interesting about theater works is you have a lot of actors who are experienced but are not publicly known they're they're new faces in theater and every so often a major talent will say I want to do a show at theater works like you had Richard Dreyfuss Mm -hmm. a few years ago and the late Valerie Hart who I know you were very uh. close to, had come to Theater Works. And yet, you know, this entire cast of American Son are names and faces I've never seen before. Mm. So you, you're seeing new interpreters of work at Theater Works where you don't have to see a star above the title. We really try and find, first and foremost, the right actor, the best actor for the part as interpreted by, you know, the director, I guess, is where it starts. And but we also look for opportunities. In fact, I can't I can't I can't really develop something. But this year we have a surprise. We have a new bartender in Christmas on the Rocks. And he's somebody that I think a lot of people will know. So we'll we'll tell you about that when the when the cameras go off. <laughs> we're about to announce that. So that's yeah, we're, be fun. well, I, I don't want you to. And you could announce it here if you want. Ah. But the fact that you the fact that you announced that Christmas on the Rocks is coming back yeah. for I don't know how many seasons now. It's one of my favorite uh, events for the holiday season at the, in in town because you get tired of a Christmas Carol and the Nutcracker and holiday pops things and you want to see something during the holidays that's totally different. Uh, Christmas yeah. on the Rocks. We love it. Mm-hmm. Jen and I can tell you that Jen and Randy are coming back this year and no one knows that yet. Uh, so Jen's back for, this is year seven. Yeah. This is Jen's sixth year. We love her so much. And Randy Harris was his first year last year. He's coming back for year two. Mm-hmm. But the bartender, I'll give you, can we give him a hint, T? Yeah. He's one of America's most famous bartenders. We love him. We love, love, love him. So there won't be any extra rehearsals teaching him how to tend bar. No. No. Okay. No, no, no. Well, anyway, we're going to take a quick break <laughs> here to acknowledge the underwriters that make Arts Beat possible here at uh, both on television and radio. And one of the reasons we're in a new studio at the Westfield Technical Academy is because students are being given the opportunity to learn the skills of radio and television, uh, because they might want to do it as a career. So uh, we're glad to be a part of that entire thing. Of course, they're all on their 
lunch breaks right now, <laughs> but uh, they, they are diligent in terms of producing. And Peter Coles is our chief engineer today. You're, if you're listening on radio, you are listening on 89.5 FM WSKB. If you're watching on Comcast in Westfield, it's on channel 15, and we will be right back. Is provided by Betts Plumbing and Heating Supply Company, an independent, family owned wholesaler serving Westfield for over 50 years, specializing in plumbing, heating, and industrial piping supplies. On the web at bettsplumbing.com or at 14 Coleman Avenue in Westfield. One of our underwriters here at WSKB's Community Radio is Carson Center for Health and Human Services, a nonprofit organization located at 20 Broad Street in Westfield. They provided behavioral health and rehabilitation services and communities throughout Western Massachusetts since 1963. There are services for children, adolescents, adults, families, and couples. You can find them on the web at carsoncenter.org or at 413-572-4132. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Comcast and Xfinity.com. Offering Xfinity TV, Internet, home phone, and home security services. Information on all that Xfinity has to offer in the Westfield area is available online at Xfinity.com. Underwriting for Community Radio on WSKB is brought to you in part by Rockies. Over 30 convenient locations throughout Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Florida. One of the nation's largest ace dealers. Expertise and great product selection in paint. Hardware, lawn and garden. That's Rockies, rock solid service since 1926. On the web at rockies.com. It's Tuesday morning from 6 till 8. Wow, it's Tuesday with Bob Plass. Community Radio 89.5 WSKB. Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM, WSKB Westfield. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Mark Auerbach, and this is Arts Beat Radio and Television, 89.5 FM WSKB, and also on TV in Westfield on Comcast 15. If you've missed a part of uh, this program this morning or you want to see some of the ones we've done in the past, you can find us on YouTube. Next week, we'll be chatting with Sean Farley from the University of Massachusetts Fine Arts Center that's having a very eclectic season this year featuring music and dance and um, theater. And Sean will kind of go through the season and let us know what's going on and uh, looking forward to that. But anyway, we're with Rob Ruggiero and Tanisha Duggan from uh, Theater Works in Hartford. Their new season is just about to open with American Sun, a play which had its world premiere in the Berkshires at Barrington Stage. And I've seen it and I was riveted by it. Um, at Barrington Stage. It moved on to Broadway. It was filmed for an eventual distribution on Netflix, and it opens the theater work season in their renovated home. So that's what you missed in the first part of <laughs> Art Speak today. But there's a whole other season coming, so one of you should start telling me about the other shows of the season. <laughs> you can get show two, T. Show two is Lifespan of, the, of a Fact, which was also on Broadway. The Lifespan. That's we keep the, doing that. We, uh, we the, keep shorthanding it. <laughs> Because we shorthand everything, you know. <laughs> who and the what is the who and the what. Um, so the lifespan of the fact uh, is was actually a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it was uh, ab- about um, an article that was written um, for, I want to say it was The New Yorker, if I'm not mistaken. It just it doesn't really say. It just In says a play, high power really, magazine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I In see. The play, uh, they take some liberties and they don't place it so firmly um, as they do in uh, the book. But essentially, it's the tension between the uh, essay writer and his fact checker uh, and the idea of who, uh, 
what's what's important to tell a good story? What's the space between actual fact and entertainment? Uh, the writer of the essay is really hoping to get uh, an emotional response from his reader, and the fact checker is saying, "That's great, but what's real is X." And so it's a it's a it's a great story to tell right now as we're engaged in that very conversation, right? Of of what's important to 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 get people in the guts and and what's important um, because truth truth outweighs that uh, and I, intention. Sorry, I saw it on, I did see that on Broadway it was with Daniel Radcliffe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I went thinking, I don't like, am I going to like this? It was Daniel Radcliffe and um, Cherry Jones. Cherry Jones, right. And the third. And Bobby Cannavale. Bobby Cannavale. So, you know, the star vehicle. And I was like, oh, this is a star vehicle. And I came back and I was like, mm-hmm. this is really funny. Because, mm-hmm. you know, all of our shows, it's, you know, the first one has a little bit of uncomfortable humor, I guess. <laughs> but, the, but all the shows of the season are kind of dramedies. And this is such a great story the antics of this kind of conflict between this very seasoned writer who's protecting art and this kind of overzealous recent Harvard graduate who's given an opportunity to fact check this article in the short term and it's really funny but at the core Tanisha's right it has this and we are we are they, they had very limited release on the right, so I had to work hard to get these. So we are one of a handful of theaters around the country who got the rights this season. Since you, you talked about uh, getting the rights to American Sun and getting the rights to this, what's the process for that? Is, is it a negotiation deal, or are, are the agents saying to please do our play? Both. I usually just call Tanisha and say, "Can you get the rights for me?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> no. Tell happens, them about the press. Kind of depends on on the project. There are some projects um, that are really fresh, fresh, um, and we might go directly to an agent because it hasn't landed uh, at a uh, publishing house yet. Uh, we have wonderful relationships with the two major uh, publishing houses. Um, so shout out to DPS and Sam French. They're wonderful to us, and we love working with them. Um, and again, it just kind of depends on the project. If if it's something coming straight out of Barrington that maybe hasn't, you know, had a life outside of there, we may be able to just have the conversation with the writer and our friends up uh, up there. Um, so it, it, it depends. Yeah, I, th- I mean, normally, if you like, if once a show is published, mm-hmm. usually picks up at one of these licensing companies. So there's a catalog, and you can do that. They often say to us, "Hey." We got this new property. Is Theater Works interested? Mm-hmm. And and we have a beautiful kind of respectful relationship that goes with that. And sometimes when it's new and you go to the agent and then you negotiate a royalty. Mm-hmm. And that sometimes, you know, makes or breaks a deal. Cause, you know, that that difference between a percent is a lot of money ultimately. Yeah. Uh, for a small theater like us too. But we have great relationships and there's a whole, you know, um, hierarchy of, of it all has to do with dollars. Like if Hartford Stage wanted one of these shows, they would probably get it over Theater Works because their capacity is larger, and and you know and it goes from down there. So, but there's a whole dialogue with the arts organizations too. So, so the the play makes money of the royalty that you pay royalties based on the number of people that potentially could see it during. You its pay trip. a royalty based on the gross can. ticket sales. Yeah. I do see it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if the Bushnell wanted to do American Sun, they'd get it before anybody else. Well, Maybe. It depends. I mean, sometimes it is just about the bottom line, and sometimes there's an artistic thing. You know, when mm. we did The Wolves, um, that negotiation was so interesting because the uh, playwright was really adamant that she didn't want any directors that weren't female or, or uh, female uh Identified. Identified. Thank you. I was like, what is the word these days? <laughs> um, and so that was a real conversation with um, both the playwright and and their licensing house about, you know, how much Eric loved that project and that he would, despite not being a woman, be able to bring um, a sensibility to that project that uh, was as meaningful um, as her um, advocacy and interest and and desire to have uh, female directors mm-hmm. centered for her project. So. You know, we have lots of artistic conversations, and sometimes in that case, if the Bushnell was saying, oh, we want to do The Wolves, and we've got a female director, but I'm coming to it and saying, no, I've got this guy, this project moves him, and the writer goes, I want to go with that 
director, you know? So it's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things at play, and it's not just capitalism all the time. So right. It's art. Yeah. It's so... We've got we've talked about three of the shows this right. season. We got a whole bunch of other stuff. So the, mm-hmm. the third show is uh, the Cake, which is actually one of the most produced shows in the country. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a comedy with really fun and poignant meaning to it, and it's really about this mid midwestern woman who's a baker who's in the, her, this she's like the Ameri- like one of those baking competitions and she's she her goddaughter i believe it's her goddaughter comes to her and asks her to make her wedding cake and in quick order she finds out that her her goddaughter is marrying a black woman <laughs> and so there's this lesbian couple and she's like I can't make the cake but what i love about the cake is not that it's we've seen that story about people who have issues with gay couples accepting them. It, what I love about the play tea, and I'm curious to hear what you say, is that it, it goes bigger than that. Yes, we know that that's going to happen, but it's really about a woman understanding she needs to change the recipe of her life. Mm-hmm. Yep. I love that phrase. It's another mm-hmm. show that I saw at Barrington Stage with the fabulous actor Deborah Jo Rupp. Who dear, lives dear in friend the, of ours, right? Yeah, we love who Deborah Who lives Joe. in the neighborhood, so to speak. She's a Berkshire's resident. Mm-hmm. And at the time that I saw it, uh, the Supreme Court was ruling over uh, a baker and a, a gay couple and whether they had a right to have whether the baker was required to uh, bake the cake, so to speak. And so I went into the theater thinking, this is really a political charged (laughs) play. And yes, it is, but uh, it also has a very sentimental, emotional side to it. And it's one of the better plays that's come out recently. And, And I've never seen it performed. Interestingly enough, but I hear and I, I you know, Deborah Joseph obviously has done multiple productions of it. And it's very funny, too, which I find, which I really like. And and for us also, we made the choice to do this as a co-production with the Repertory Theater of St. Louis, because we're also looking to make sure that we have connections like nationally. Hannah Sharif, who used to be at Hartford Stage, friend of ours, took over the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. And, you know, we talked about partnering and we were both doing the show and I was like, you want to do it together? And she's she's kind of mentoring this young lesbian director and really wanted her to do it. And I trust that Hannah, you know, Hannah will be there. We're doing it there first Mm -hmm. and we'll be involved with the casting and the design and all that. And then it's coming over to us. And... It was just a great opportunity to partner with somebody who we respect and and love and support her in the first season. And it's a very prop heavy show, as you know. So it was a way for us to share in some of that, too. Mm -hmm. And Um, opening us up to some new artists. Sarah Bruner is the director. Um, We have, as Rob said, we've never worked with her before, but we're always excited to to bring some new folks to the mix. Um, Some new costume designers and set designers to mm -hmm. our audiences. Um, It is a mostly female um, design team, which we're very excited about. Um, that was sort of Sarah and Hannah's interest was to make sure that that team uh, felt representative of that story. So we're excited by that that collaboration between Hannah's team and, and our team. Yeah. Is this the first collaborative effort that you've done with another theater company? Oh, no, no, no. We've done them over the... Like, we, you know... Um, uh, the other, the other place. Remember the show, the other place. Yes, we did that as also a co-pro with Repertory Theater St. Louis. Rabbit Hole. We did. Uh, we didn't do. Wasn't a co-pro, but we did a shared production of Rabbit Hole with Pittsburgh Public Theater. We've um, uh, so. We I don't think we've done a lot. Oh, Barrington Stage, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. becoming Doctor Ruth. Uh, you know, and um, it was one other one. But, but we love those partnerships. They actually, what we find, which is interesting, don't save as much money as you would think because, you know, you share casting, you share costumes and sometimes props and sometimes parts of the set or the whole set. But ultimately, it's a lovely kind of mutual opportunity, opportunity to mutually create something mm-hmm. and, and really invest in partnership, which we Absolutely. love. Absolutely. And as Rob said, you know, with this renovation, we're really looking at ourselves in a new way and really wanting to sort of reassert ourselves as one of the best mid-sized contemporary theaters in the country. And part of doing that is making sure that we are out there in the country, um, sharing resources with our friends, but also getting our name out there to the, you know, 
of those audiences around the country who will begin to see both our theater and Hartford as a place to come to see the, you know, the amazing Theater of Americas. It seems to be a more common thing in, in uh, regional theater now mm-hmm. to share productions or co-produce. Uh, uh, Quixote Nuevo at Hartford Stage is a shared production by three major national theaters. And so it, put, it puts their name out there in other communities. And I would assume something like this puts the theater works name in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Right. Although Absolutely. Although you've directed quite a bit. I in do. Louis. I have. I have there, and you know, going back this summer, uh, they haven't announced their season yet, but I'm going back to do a, a Sondheim musical at the Muni. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it, yeah, I love St. Louis. You know, it's great. But I also feel like for the artists, for the actors and the director, you know, we always like learn something from a run, right? Mm-hmm. You rehearse the show, you do the show, and you run it. You're like, oh, and then you open. And then when you open, technically, you can't really, you can maintain, but you can't change. And we always talk, oh, if I only did this, if I knew then what I knew now. Mm-hmm. So for the actors, also that happens, and for the directors, that happens. So it's an opportunity between theaters to, to, to address those things mm-hmm. and to go in again. Yeah, and to create an ecosystem of support and work, right? So much of this Absolutely. lifestyle is jumping from project to project to project. And to be able to promise to artists that they can have a real salary and a living for uh, for a chunk of time is a gift that I think we're beginning to understand as a, an industry at large we can provide if we work together in this way. So it's got a you know lots of tentacles, both the the cost sharing and the savings. It's got that we're going to support our artists in a real way so they can have equitable you know living uh, and the artistic, which is that we know that American regional theater is the place where the canon is created. How do we do that and improvise and improve upon the work that we're doing and not just throw it up there once and mm-hmm. watch it? dissipate but that really give it a life it seems that in regional theater uh there's a lot more creativity happening these days than there is commercially on broadway i think so and i think part of that is you know we even have this conversation when we're picking the season you know how risk averse should we be can we make really risky choices or do we need to make really smart choices and i think we're finding that broadway is really about making the sort of smart economic choices star vehicles and things that come from books and movies because you know people are going to show up for it Um, and i think we as regional theaters are saying okay so if that's what's happening on the great white way what's our response to that and what can Mm. we do to offer some some work that we believe in that is not just back to the future (laughs) absolutely and also being someone who's had the good fortune to have a couple of broadway experiences and a lot of regional experiences i have to tell you most of my peers will say we prefer regional too when you have that much money and that much pressure into a broadway show there's a there's like an army of people like over your shoulder with opinions with ideas with suggestions and with directives <laughs> you know in the regional <clears throat> space you have a lot more artistic breath and freedom well actually it, you are bringing a commercial show or show that began life in the commercial theater uh the theater works and it's the tony award-winning musical fun Hunt. <laughs> i did not see it in new york where it was i guess in a smaller theater but i saw the national tour at the bushnell and it was a small musical produced in this huge, huge space. space and it lost something in the translation um i mean i found i respected it but the idea that it's coming to theater works the same way that next to normal came a couple of years ago that on broadway was in a large theater coming into an intimate space changes the entire scope of the show we heard you know we heard that so much with next to normal there were a lot of people who were like well i had seen it at the bush now and or seen it on broadway and it was like really a profoundly successful for us but but what people didn't figure into the equation but they quickly did and then they just kept coming <laughs> was it's different at theater works 
because and and what we're excited about is the, the and I'm personally excited about because I'm directing it is the chance to explore that musical in our space as much as produce the musical and Mike Isaacson the executive producer of the musical who kind of shepherded it from its beginnings to the public to Broadway you know is a dear friend of mine he runs the Muni so I have a connective tissue into that whole process but but we're going to have our own production of that uh, and beautiful, beautiful musical. It is, and uh, we're going to end the show today uh, with a little excerpt from it. Because ah. I happen to like the score. I think it's an interesting show. And I like the idea of it being pared down for a small theater. I'd be interested to see how Anastasia, which opened at Hartford Station, they went on to be a big Broadway hit, is en route to the Bushnell uh, in January. Be interested to see. Are you making how- a pitch? No. Ah. <laughs> but I, it'll be interesting to see how it is in a big huge mm. version yes. based uh, as opposed to being able to reach out and touch mm. or in the same case of Barrington stage that it did on the town a few years ago in a smaller theater then I, we went to see it when it went to Broadway yeah. it was huge yeah. and um, I don't know there's something about fun home that makes me think it should be done in an intimate setting well, we agree because we're, we're excited to do it. Okay, we're going to have to take another break very soon here to acknowledge our underwriters. Next week, we'll have Sean Farley from the University of Massachusetts Fine Arts Center talking about their current season. And the week after, we'll be chatting with JPEG Luca and Patrick Berry, who are two well-known names in Westfield, who started a company called Gaslight Entertainment to produce a year-long music series, which kicks off in November in Westfield. This is Arts Beat Radio on 89.5 FM WSKB, Channel 15 Comcast in Westfield. I'm Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer, and we'll be right back. Support for community radio on WSKB provided by Westfield Electroplating. Employing over 140 skilled platers, painters, and technicians, Westfield Electroplating was founded in 1946 and was the first company in the country to achieve National Aerospace and Defense Contractor Program accreditation, proudly maintaining that status for over a decade. Westfield Electroplating provides over 50 quality finishes to meet your corrosion, cosmetic, or performance needs. On the web at www.westfieldplating.com or 413-568. 3716. Westfield Electroplating, putting the finishing touches on technology. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Barnes and Noble College Bookstore in the Ely Campus Center, offering Westfield State t shirts, sweatshirts, and gift merchandise, all of your academic needs, and offering textbook materials in new, used, ebook, and rental formats. Available at the bookstore on campus or online at westfieldstate.bncollege.com. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Bay State Dental. Comprehensive dentistry at 14 convenient locations in Springfield, Chicopee, Longmeadow, West Springfield, Belchertown, East Longmeadow, Ludlow, Northampton, Greenfield, and Wilbraham, as well as 29 Broad Street in Westfield. Bay State Dental makes it a priority to help you achieve and maintain the healthy smile you deserve. On the web at baystatedental.com. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Westfield Bank. For more than 160 years, Westfield Bank has been an important community presence and commercial leader in the Pioneer Valley. With convenient full banking services in Westfield, West Springfield, East Longmeadow, Agawam, Feeding Hills, Springfield, Southwick, as well as Enfield and Granby, Connecticut. Visit us on the web at westfieldbank.org. Wednesday mornings from 6 till 8, it's Tina Gorman with Wake Up Wednesday. Community Radio, 89.5 WSKB. Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM WSKB Westfield. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Mark Auerbach. This is Arts Beat Radio. We're having this fabulous hour with Tanisha Dugan and Rob Ruggiero from Theater Works. We've been chatting about their upcoming season, the renovations that are happening and are uh, about to 
present in a brand new home in a beautiful old space. And uh, it's really so good to have both of you oh, here. i got to say, so nice to you know, you. I've always felt, uh, and this is a very biased statement, I've always felt like a part of the family at Theater Works because uh, you've opened uh, uh, up your home to Arts Beat Radio on multiple occasions. And well, we hope you'll come back and, in our new space. I can't wait. Uh, Maybe uh, in our new living room space. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't wait. And I mean, you guys do some stuff in the music uh, living room series that you're doing and some of the other things that you're bringing in. You That's become, Tanisha. She's like, yeah, man, like all our events. You've become a vital uh, community source and, and for, for more than theater, I think it's really terrific. But before we, um, well, while we were on the break, we mentioned one show that we really didn't highlight in any way. So let's talk about that one because it's a, providing a theatrical voice of a community that you don't hear enough about. Yeah, you know, we talked earlier uh, in the first segment about the who and the what. Um, it's an Ayat Akhtar piece um, uh, directed by Anisha Kudhar. Kud Tarkar, uh, who's a new director for us. Um, we're excited by it because our audiences have loved Ayad. Ayad's work is so smart. Um, we know uh, that people just love to hear his, I mean, he's a Pulitzer Prize uh, winner at this point, or was he just mm-hmm. a nominee? Um, no, and the piece is, you know, you say it best, right? It is sort of your average. average. What is <laughs> I said your average dysfunctional Muslim American family. Yeah. They're, you know, <laughs> sort of talking at the intersection of, of uh, culture and heritage and tradition and new and a new way of looking at things. It's kind of in some ways an old story. Uh, it feels very much like an immigrant story, right? It's, it's what happens when the new generation takes on the old traditions and wants to change them or leave some Challenge. behind yeah um and so we're excited we're very excited i love that when i i didn't read it for a while she said it was like given to me and i was like the who and the what you know that title that's a you know that's a, it's a it's a cool title when you know the plea but like what do you do and i was like we were looking and looking and i just sat down and i read it and i think i called them and i was like we and i would just like we're doing it like it's rare that I have one of those things because because Ayad's work, when you think, is always this other work is intense, mm-hmm. very intense, very intelligent, beautiful very writing, very political. This is very different than the other work, and I feel like you know, in search for the humor element in the season, literally, I read out, I laughed out loud multiple times reading the story, and yet. It has a solid, solid foundation about generational mm-hmm. dynamics, mm-hmm. and you know it, it, it's a and like the one of the bylines is you know just your average um, dysfunctional family, and it's you know one of the posters had it inserted that said Muslim American. I thought that was so funny, and it's he's um, uh, was uh, South Asian, not born in America, but but American. He's Pakistani. I think Pakistani. he's yeah. I think he's. Pa- you're right, yeah, Pakistani. And he has a taxi company. I've got him remembering all this <laughs> stuff. And he has two daughters. So he's his father with two daughters. But I just have to say, like, this one little thing early in the play, you see him meet this man who's, and the man's like, who are you? And he's like, thinks he's, he's his daughter. What he's gone on is like onto social media dating sites <laughs> and, and posted a profile for his daughter and has to meet the men first and they don't know this is happening <laughs> so he can choose the husband for her mm-hmm. and and like you know you get like there you go right that just mashed I, up of traditional yeah, yeah but right in that yeah. it just was so funny that situation and i really think it's both a great play a really great play with great writing and it also has that situational comedy in it which i love i found his play disgraced uh, mm-hmm. an amazing one and then the invisible hand that you guys did and he's gotten so many awards Mm -hmm. for writing and his work is really accessible but i sat there during disgraced and i thought i'm seeing a different perspective he's talking about a different perspective than i would have had going into a dinner party like Mm -hmm. that 
And then, of course, there's this intense a message about making this particular orange and fennel salad <laughs> that I had to have like two or three days after I saw the play. <laughs> but I think it's so important that we hear these other voices in theater yeah. or in any art form, whether it's music or dance, that, I mean, we're, America is a melting pot of many different nationalities, religions, mm-hmm. cultures, genders, Colors. and all that. All that. And Theater seems to be the most accepting form for people to express themselves to other audience people, where as films seem to stereotype things, but in live theater you have this dialogue from audience to actor and back and forth that really gives these voices a chance to be heard. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting, because one of the things that Tanisha and Eric um, my other associate is also are doing is getting me to think a little differently. And when we find these writers that we're responding to over and over again, or that we really love and respect, my dream, our dream, is that we will be like, "Hey, you want to, you want you have something you're working on, or you want to create something for us? Come, we want to. Cre- I think I, I really do believe that we're um, uh, on a path to making something like that happen. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you, Rob, because it was announced the other day on Facebook that you're returning to Goodspeed this summer, (laughs) and you've done a lot of work there over the years, but you're going to do South Pacific. Yes, we're opening their their 2020 season. And you're you're doing stuff at the Muni, but you've made theater works your home for so many years. Um, It must give you, it's having a homecoming in a new renovated theater space must be an awesome feeling yeah absolutely it's so i'm so proud i mean this is my i mean i my history goes way back as everybody knows by now i think this is my 26th season and it's my i think coming into my coming into my seventh year as officially the producing artistic director it's crazy and um, and and I'm really excited. Goodspeed is another artistic home. There are a handful of theaters that are for me. I love going there. I love uh, the people there and the audience there. And our audiences cross over. A lot of people will come to theater work say, and I love your work at Goodspeed too. Yeah. Um, but I'm. This will be. I said this at the, at the press event at the um, s- subscriber event. I think it was uh, talk, announcing their season. Um, I. Um, uh, this is my fourth South Pacific. You know, I am a Rogers and Hammerstein freak. I love r and I'm good friends with Ted Chapin, who, um, uh, and, you know, I, my history goes back. This is my fourth one, and I, when I told Goodspeed, when Goodspeed asked me, I'm like, I'll do it, but I want to be able to, 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 to do something new. I want to be able to look at it differently. And Ted and I have been talking, and but I, I announced uh, that I'm going to look at the show more distinctly through the lens of Nellie Forbish instead of leading with the love story and her journey. And I, I'm really excited. And it's opened up all these things. You know, when you just make when you when you point yourself in a direction, you use that lens. It it sheds light it sheds a light on different things. So I'm excited to pursue that. Tanisha, how did you get to Theater Works? Uh, a long and winding trail, um, but I am an actor by craft uh, and <laughs> have uh, done many things. I marketed for American Girl, which I'm sure many uh, parents know, um, before doing some marketing work for Social Justice Theater in Hartford uh, and then shifting over to Theater Works. Um, in my capacity now, so yeah. But you were an, an actor. Yeah, but I'm an actor by by. But on our God. stage. And I did, I did, I I uh, performed in race. Um, <laughs> well, many years ago yes. now, but so, she yeah, first yeah. came as a guest artist, yeah, yeah, yeah. as yeah. an actor, yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy, and uh, and here she is, and we're so grateful to have her. She's uh, an. Uh, uh, somebody who is a real guiding light for me and and I think we're finding a vibe that's really fun and you know I I feel like her voice is unique and is elevating us our organization so 
And you have such a great team of people there. And uh, one is Freddie McInerney, who's uh, your marketing and PR. Who's a she? Not people know that. They always say Freddie. Freddie is a she. <laughs> and Eric Ort, who yeah. um, directed The Wolves and uh, has done some other work. It. I just imagine in my life that it would be so much fun to be at Theatre Works every day because you all have this spirit about bringing great theater to people. Yeah, I, I, you know, I go, I travel all over the country, and there are great teams. Mm -hmm. But you know, the staff at Theatre Works, I, I mean, all I can say is I get a lot of accolades about Theatre Works and about me leading Theatre Works, and it takes. A, I, I really wouldn't be getting those if it weren't for those now nineteen other people who surround me and make me better every day. So. Okay, I really want to thank both of you for being here today. But before we move on, you have to tell people how to get tickets and where <laughs> Theater Works is in Hartford. Beautiful. You want me to do it? Go ahead. Go for it. Oh, well, I'll do one. You do the website. 233 <laughs> Pearl Street. We're in downtown Hartford, 233 Pearl Street. Plenty of parking, plenty of great restaurants. Our website is theaterworkshartford.org or twhartford.org, which is a little easier to remember. <laughs> it, it is, and uh, the season opens with American Sun. Uh, it's a play that I won't give it away because I've seen it, but it is such a riveting play. If my experience at it is like anybody else's. It's a play that you're going to talk about for quite a while afterwards. I mean, I think I saw it three years ago and I was writing the advance for it. And I thought I went back and I read the review and then I talked with the person I had gone to and we it comes up in conversation all the time. And I'm thinking, wow, uh, this play will have an impact on you. And it's it, a rare experience when you get to see a show and you talk about it three years later. Hmm. And it's either got to be super, super good or absolutely the worst thing in the world <laughs> you've ever seen. And well, to me, American Sun is super, super good. Well, you know you say that. And, and all kidding aside, like when we look at the body of our work and work that I encounter as an audience member every, around the country, country we all prefer something that you talk about like for for days or hopefully weeks or whatever versus I loved it end of conversation I hated it end of conversation we try and do work that provokes that 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 conversation with the theater and the community and with in the community themselves that's our goal yeah. Are you going to do any talkbacks uh, during the uh, or after the performances? Yeah, we always do talkbacks. You know, we're well known for our talkback Tuesdays. Those are things that I moderate, um, and they always um, are sort of are crafted around a, a, a particular conversation we want to have. Um, that we, we find important for the show. So we'll continue with those. We're piloting some new ways of, of having conversation and encouraging conversation in our new space. And so we look forward to people trying that out. I don't know um, if we have time. Do you want to tell but the, what we're trying that first weekend? Yeah, the first weekend, preview weekend, uh, we are opening up our space post-show to really a free-form conversation. We'll offer... Um, uh, prompts uh, for internal dialogues, but it won't be uh, formally led. Uh, we'll probably have some special guests there, uh, director, uh, cast members, designers, if you wanted to grab one of them and have a conversation over a cocktail and some... In our living room space, in room not in the space. theater, yeah. like in the new the new lobby living room space, a place to kind of hang out and talk about the show, mm -hmm. and we'll just mingle. Way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're excited by that. Well, I want to thank both of you for coming up from Hartford here to our new digs in Westfield to chat this morning. It's always a pleasure, and I'm, I can't wait to see American Sun in the rest of the season. We've been chatting today with Tanisha Dugan and Rob Ruggiero from Theater Works. They are the people behind a really incredible upcoming season in Hartford. So so you'll want to get there. Next week, Sean Farley from the University of Massachusetts Fine Arts Center will be with us. We're looking forward to that. And uh, the week after, we'll be learning about Gaslight Entertainment, uh, a new music series coming to Westfield in November. So this is Arts Beat Radio. Peter Coles is our chief engineer today. Uh, we are broadcasting from new studios at the Westfield Technical Academy, and their students are helping us with all kinds of production 
much, and, and we're glad to have them on board. I'm Mark Auerbach for Artsbeat on 89.5 FM WSKB and Channel 15 Comcast in Westfield. See you next week.